Shall we pray, brothers and sisters? Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that your love is an overcoming love. And we honor you, glorify you, that you are the God who comes to us. Speak to us, Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, that we might know the King of glory. He has come, and he is coming again. In your mighty name, amen. Yeah, it's very good, uh, Chapel of Christ the Redeemer, for my wife and I to be here to start the season of Advent with you. We have been on a preaching circuit. We've also been overseas, so it's really wonderful. We're back to be here with you as we start Advent. Advent means coming, the coming of the Lord. And we are remembering his first coming on, the, on your left, how Christ came in human flesh to save us, to be our redeemer, to be our shepherd. But we are also anticipating his coming again, when he comes again as the glorious king to judge the earth. Uh, he lived, died, rose again, ascended on high, and he's reigning, he's reigning today, and he is coming again. That's going to be our focus, his return, when he comes again. So when Christ comes again, he will put everything right. How we long for it, friends, because we live in a sin-damaged, pain-ridden world. I felt that acutely, some of you, uh, you will feel it from time to time, uh, the pain that this world, which is subject to decay and death and tragedy, you will feel it. The injustice and the tragedies uh, that happen. So it hit me and my wife when our very good friend, uh, Joseph Chen, passed away, was killed actually in an accident in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. He was on mission. He's in his early 50s, two lovely daughters, history education. So on the field, in the cause of serving the Lord, he gets killed and the church, and I share this with you because we are part of, the part of the Anglican Church, and we are part of the church in Singapore. And the church in Singapore has lost someone who was a great mobilizer for world missions, and we feel it. So I long for the day when the Lord will put everything right. I'm sure as you read the papers, and as you hear the news or watch it on TV, you know the world... <laughs> It's terribly wrong, and there's so much of pain in the world, and so much of injustice in the world. Now, friends, it's not only out there in the world, it's also in our own world, in our family, in our workplaces. Things are out of sync, and we are often at odds with each other. There's opposition, and there is oppression, and so forth. So we really long for when the Lord will return to put everything right. No more fighting, no more injustice, no more pain, no more decay. And in Singapore, because of the aging population, all of us experience it in one way or another. You know, this world, yeah, this present existence, it's such a hard uh, pilgrimage and no more suffering. Now, when the Lord returns, the wicked will be judged, and the righteous will be saved for a glorious new world. So when our Lord returns, evil will be punished, and evil persons, uh, wrongdoers will be punished. There is justice in the world, and it's on that final day. So with God's judgment, so he judges those who are against him and refuse to obey him, and he saves those who put their trust in him, who put their trust in the lamb that was slain. 
So that's the day when Christ returns. So Advent, therefore, is a season of repentance and hope-filled expectation. Repentance because, as Randall uh, led us as we began the service, to be ready for the Lord's return. Are you ready? It's a question we ask in Advent. Am I ready when he comes in judgment? And that is why uh, the posture in uh, Advent is uh, repentance and the church liturgical color is, is purple. Because we recognize there are many things wrong and there may be many things wrong in my relationship with God. And I want to be restored. It's also a season for hope-filled expectation. And that's why in some of our families, especially if you're in a Christian family, you put up the Christmas tree. And I know my mother-in-law, my own parents, they prepare delicacies. So as Indian Christians, we no longer celebrate Deepavali. We have met the king of glory, the light of the world. And so we carry the customs, you know, over. If you're in a non-Christian family, I want to encourage you, do something special for your household, for your people at home. And let them know the king has come, and that's why we have this hope. So there's repentance, and there is hope. We are focusing today on the second coming of Christ, and our topic is stay tuned. Stay tuned to what God is doing so that you're ready for his coming. Now, this stay tuned, uh, those of you who do listen to radio as I do in my car, they often try to get you to stay tuned by telling you there's a game coming up, you can win prizes, etc. Right? It's a very, it's a very light and friendly invitation. But this stay tuned in the Bible, you have those words there, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. So it's a different stay tuned. Stay tuned with all your life. Don't miss it. Because it'll cost you. You must stay awake. And you must be in tune with what God is doing. So the question for us this morning as we come to God's word, how can we stay tuned to what God is doing? How can we be ready for the return of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. So we are in Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 13. And his great friends, I always encourage you as does your pastor, it's good to have the word of God open if you have it on your phone or in a book. Uh, please have it opened because this is God's word written down for us. And the more we receive it, the stronger we will be for life's journey. So we are in Mark chapter 13. I draw your attention to three ways in which we can stay tuned. First, heed the prophecies in the Word of God. Heed the prophecies in God's Holy Word. Heed means you pay close attention to and you respond. That's what we want to do. And the Bible gives us prophecies about the major events in God's salvation history. So God is engaged in this world. He's the Lord of history. And things happen in history to fulfill his salvation plan. And there are at least three events that I call your attention to because Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will, not, will never pass away. Are you with me, friends? So as we think, we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe what is said in the Bible about the second coming? So these three events, let me start first with the coming of the Lord, his first coming, the first coming of Christ as saviour of the world. So Messiah means anointed king. And God promised his people of all Israel that he will send the anointed king, the Messiah, to redeem them, to restore them. And this is especially when we, they were under foreign domination. So at the time of the Romans, they were waiting 
for their redemption, to be redeemed, to be set free, the restoration of Israel. They were waiting for the king. And the king is described in Matthew's gospel as the one who will save his people from their sins. Isaiah 53, these are prophecies, right? So he will save them by taking the sins of the people upon himself. And it'll be a painful death because it says he will be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement, the judgment of God that we deserve was laid on him. And we are set free from guilt and from the judgment of God. And this king, when he comes, uh, he will make it possible for people to experience God as Emmanuel. God with us. Not God against us, but God with us. And this promised king will be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, and he will come not from high-standing Jerusalem. He will not be born there. He will be born in lowly Bethlehem, Michael 5. So all these prophecies, they're quite mysterious there in the Old Testament, but they were fulfilled. They came to pass what God says God will deliver. And they came, they were fulfilled when Jesus became and came for us as Son of Man and Son of God. So the promise of the anointed king, the king from David's line, that would come to redeem God's people. And the promise was heeded by simple folk with strong faith in this God. People like Zechariah and Elizabeth. So as we come into Advent and into Christmas, we'll be reading these passages in Luke's Gospel and also in Matthew's Gospel. So you have Zechariah and Elizabeth who are the parents of John the Baptist. You have Joseph and Mary who are the parents of our Lord. You have a Simeon and Anna, um, senior citizens, but who are holding on to the promise of God, holding on to the prophecies that the Messiah will come and change our life forever. They're holding on. You also have the shepherds on the field. And the shepherds on the field are willing to receive revelation from angels who tell them today in the city of David, in the town of Bethlehem, is born a savior. And you also have astronomers, wise men, who pay attention to this star that is unique, and they follow the stars. So we want to follow the example, friends. We want to heed the prophecies. Now, there's a second event in salvation history that comes to us in Mark chapter 13. It's about the destruction of Jerusalem. So we need, <laughs> by our imagination, huh, we go back to Palestine, to the region where Jesus had his ministry. Now, he was not a person associated with great power. Yet, many people followed him because of his miracles and of his teaching and all. So, if you like, he was a popular evangelist, but he was not in the power elite. He was not part of the ruling establishment. But he came as the Son of God, clothed humbly in human flesh. And then he declares, I'm going to be crucified. The Son of Man is going to suffer and die, but rise again. When he is crucified and risen, Jerusalem will be destroyed. Now, you can imagine if someone said this about Parliament House or the cathedral, that the day will come that the temple will be destroyed. That's how Mark 13, verse 1 starts, you see. He says in verse 2, Jesus says to them, they're all admiring this majestic uh, temple that was built by Herod. Do you see these great buildings? 
there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. It's a staggering prophecy. If, if you and I heard a prophecy like that, we really wonder about the person, whether the person is of sound mind, you know. And we can't imagine that the whole temple or this great iconic building is going to crumble. It's going to crumble because of the judgment of God. So we're dealing now with prophecies that are not comfortable. And the prophecies about our Lord's come, uh, return are not comfortable. And Jesus says to his audience, then he says to them, there's going to be an event that will tell you disaster is coming. When that event happens, run for your life. Because it will be total chaos and total destruction. So uh, your pastor wonderfully has designed this Advent series. And we start now with preparing for the Lord's second coming. And we have to hear not what we like to think about the second coming, but what the Bible teaches about the second coming. Jesus says to them, after my death and resurrection, Jerusalem is going to face the worst disaster it has ever faced. Foreign troops are going to invade the land, and this temple is going to come crashing down. And he says that the event that you must watch for is called the abomination of desolation. That's in verse 14. So abomination of desolation means that foreign armies are going to come and they're going to take over the temple, they're going to stop the sacrifice system, and they will set up in the middle of the temple a pagan idol or a pagan image to show Rome reigns, you see. Forget about Yahweh. What can Yahweh do? Rome is in power. And it's going to cause a great desolation. Uh, the land and its inhabitants are going to be dispersed and the land left desolate. He says when that happens, so can you see the prophecies are very precise, specific. I want you to know in AD 70, it happened. It happened. No one expected it. But the Roman armies came in and ransacked. They burnt out the temple and they crucified thousands and thousands of Jews. And why we need to uh, note this is, this is God's judgment upon a stubbornly disobedient people. Are you with me, friends? <laughs> not, not the best news on a Sunday morning. But to get ready for his return, you need to know our God, who is the Father of love, is also a fiery, is fiery in his wrath. Our God is a consuming fire. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These are words from Scripture. So we need <laughs> to know this second coming makes us alert. No, it's not, oh, Christmas is here, we've got another year, and so forth. We need to know he's coming again, and are you ready? And every prophecy will happen. So when Jerusalem gets ransacked and destroyed, it's God's judgment. And the old covenant with the Mosaic law and the temple practices could not produce a people who glorified God, could not produce an obedient people who would be the light to the nations. So the old covenant is shown to have failed, not because there's something wrong with the covenant, but because there's something that's so hard to change in the human heart. The law is good, but the law cannot produce goodness. It needs Jesus to wash our sin and to give us the spirit and give us a new heart. So God's judgment came down. Now, we, this is the second event that I wanted to draw your attention to because it prefigures the third event. The third event is the Lord's return, the second coming of our Lord. And in the second coming of our Lord, the prophecies, again, in Scripture, 
will be fulfilled and it will usher in the day of judgment. And in the day of judgment, there is the judgment of evil and evildoers and there's the full salvation of God's people. So when Christ returns the second time, judgment in one hand, salvation in the other hand, evil and evil persons will be cast, the Bible uses poetic language, into outer darkness. And those whose names are in the book of life, your name in the book of life, are you walking with Jesus? Do you know the King? Does He know you, more importantly? then you will be ushered into the new heaven and the new earth. So I need to allow the word of God to ask you today, do you believe in judgment? Do you believe in judgment day? There was a survey recently of Christians. Less than half believe in God's judgment. Less than half. It's there, but they can't wrap their mind around it, you see. But <sighs> prophecies, heed them. He will come with fire. It's there in the prophetic books. It's there in Paul's teaching. And it's there in the book of Revelation. He will tread the winepress. So Pol Pot and Hitler and all of those who commit, not just the big time evildoers, but we who oppress people, who don't keep our promises, who have false idols in our life, we will experience the judgment of God unless we cling to Christ and put on his righteousness. So what are the signs that will precede this final day where God settles everything? Do you know no sin and no evil act will go unpunished? Because at the heart of the universe is a moral God. Otherwise, what's the point of trying to live well? Each man can do, each person can do whatever they want, but we will be held accountable. And when the Son of Man returns, will he find his people ready? The signs that precede the coming of that final day, I mentioned just a few of them, so you can watch for them. Because the title is, was laid on the, your pastor's side, is stay tuned. Watch what is happening so that you can participate in what God is doing. So what will happen? Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes and famines, but these are only the beginning of birth pangs. There will be false prophets and false saviors. There will be authoritarian figures seeking world domination, building the city of man, rejecting the city of God. Man with his own system, we can do it. We don't need God. We can build a better world. So it has been <laughs> the, the, the chorus of many leaders has yet to come. There will be moral collapse and blatant rebellion of God. Lawlessness. Uh, so I trust as I, I, as I list them, you are realizing these signs are already upon us. And then this gospel must be preached, proclaimed throughout the world. That's Matthew 24. This gospel must be proclaimed to every people group and then the end will come. So first the prophecies. Second, we need to fulfill the ministry God has given us. This comes in verse 34, Mark 13, 34. Jesus says, you do not know the time. You do not know when it'll come. It'll catch you, if you like, by surprise. People will be eating and drinking and having marriage celebrations and all, but then the day of judgment comes. You do not know the time. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. So he tells it in a story form. A person goes, so the Lord has 
ascended on high. He's going to return, but in the meantime, he has put us to work. He's given us our duties, our assignments, and he expects us to fulfill our ministry, right? That's what it says. He puts his servants in charge, each with his work. So my friends, if you have been saved by Jesus, you have been saved to serve Jesus. You were not saved to become a new religious consumer. You were saved in order that you might serve the Lord in a broken down world. And he's given us gifts and graces. So to stay tuned is to fulfill your ministry. May the Lord not find us sleeping or neglecting our ministry. I'm with you, friends, because ministry is tough. And we need the help of the Spirit, and we need one another to encourage us to keep going in ministry. In ministry, you can be discouraged. You can be disillusioned, because our expectations tend to be high about working and serving in church. But then we meet vessels that are all in the making. Our weaknesses and also maybe our rough edges don't go away straight away. Don't get changed overnight. And we get discouraged. Sometimes promises are made and not kept and they say, oh, I've had it. This uh, getting ready for the Lord's return is to come out of discouragement. It's also to come out of distraction because Particularly in a society like Singapore, work is all engrossing. Uh, I'm, well, uh, I'm retired now, <laughs> although I'm engaged in ministry, but I can see my children, married, the family, and demands of work, and how the technology conspires, because your work follows you, right? And people send you emails late at night, and they need a response the next morning, and so forth. So we can be very distracted and all consumed uh, by work. We can also, of course, be mesmerized by the shining rewards of the world, the extra pay and the possessions and so forth, status. So for different reasons, we not be fulfilling what the Lord gave us to do. And I want this morning to pause because I believe the Lord wants to restore us. There's discouragement, there's distraction, there's also depletion. And because we are running at such a high speed with many, many fronts, some of us are really, really depleted. And the Lord said to his disciples when they were really highly uh, engaged in ministry, he says, come away with me and rest a while. So I pray, Advent, and perhaps as you pencil in next year, friends, if you don't pencil in your rest, your family holiday, chances are it won't happen. But we need, we, we need times of refreshing, times of replenishment, times of healing, right? So the Lord wants us to stay tuned means you're at your post. It doesn't mean you're there all the time because there are times you need to be replenished. Are you with me, friends, yeah? Because the Lord wants us to find us faithful at his return. He wants us, Micah 6, 8, simple one, to do justly, that means to do what is right in God's eyes, to do justly, to love mercy. You have received mercy from God, be merciful, be kind to others, and to walk humbly. To walk humbly also has to walk carefully with God, just walk with God. He has shown thee, O man, what is good. So this is what we do to get ready for the Lord's return. Now, this uh, verse has another part. It says that and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. 
Man's the doorkeeper. So these are wonderful stories, uh, inspired illustrations by our Lord. So the people in the house are busy about the ministry God has given us. But he also says that the doorkeeper, there's a doorkeeper that is needed. Now this doorkeeper guards the doctrine of the church. Now, I'm sure, as I soon as, soon as I say that, guards the doctrine of the church, they say, oh, yeah, your work, now, Bishop. <laughs> your work, uh, Pastor Glenn and the pastoral staff, you know, your work, guard the gates. I want to tell you, guarding the gate goes way beyond this. Guarding the gate includes the teachers in the children's ministry, Guarding the gates includes all those who are doing chaplaincy work. We are teaching them God's right and wrong. I want to go one step further, friends. Guarding the gate is the responsibility of every Christian parent. You cannot be left just to the pulpit ministry because our children are living in a very different world. There's great confusion about what is right or wrong. And it's a media-saturated world. So it can't be the weekly. It must include the family. Uh, just last Sunday, uh, again, my wife and I, we had the privilege, joy, to be at a wedding the church we pastored for 20 years in John St. Margaret. And the young bride, the young bride in her thank you speech, she said, I thank my parents because they were strict with me. Everybody, ah, strict. And then she said, not strict for me to do well in school and to have many achievements, but strict in my behavior and my values. They made sure that I was courteous to people who came to the house to visit. They made sure I will tell the truth honestly. And this is what <laughs> this bride, and I thought, yeah, I pray it'll be so. Discipline is never easy. But in a fallen world, discipline it must be exercised with love. And we thank God very often, now that I am in my late 60s, I thank God for my parents and how they were strict about values, strict about time, strict about family devotion. And in God's grace, that's how to guard the gate, to know what is right and wrong and to want to fulfill that. So friends, stay tuned. How? Heed the prophecies. Second, practice, fulfill your ministry. But here's the third. Evangelize the lost whom the Lord longs to gather. Evangelize the lost. It comes to us in verse 27. In verse 27, our Lord says, and he identifies himself as the Son of Man, in Daniel's vision. So sometimes we don't know what, 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 uh, what is going on if we don't know the word of God. So be patient, but be persevering. So what is this son of man coming with the clouds of heaven? So this is in verse 27, right? Let me read verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather elect from the four winds. That means from everywhere, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So Jesus is saying, when I return, I will come like the person described in Daniel's vision. Son of man means the representative of humankind. And Jesus is the true representative. Adam failed, but the second Adam was obedient and faithful to the fullest extent. 
And he now, so if you go to Daniel, there are four beasts. The beasts represent these brutal kingdoms that bring untold suffering, but they don't have power for long. And finally, the reins of power are given to one who, like the Son of Man, approaches the Ancient of Days. It's a glorious vision. I leave it to you, Daniel chapter 7. But Jesus is saying, I will receive authority and power. Clouds of power means divine. Uh, they say divine power, divine glory. And I will return. And when I return, what is he going to do? He's going to gather the elect. What a lovely phrase. Uh, the elect. The elect are the chosen ones of God. God's chosen ones who respond to the gospel and receive his mercy, who say to God, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> and I thank you for the gift of a savior. That's the elect. Friends, I'm not going to be elect if we don't evangelize. Amen. If the Lord is going to have the joy of gathering the elect, it's a call for you and me to bring them home to the Lord. And so, this Advent, I leave you these three things about staying in tune. First, heed the prophecies. Especially the fiery judgment that is part of our Lord's return. Not all, he comes to save and usher the new heaven and the new earth, but not without judging evil, and casting out evildoers. They have no part in this kingdom. Second, fulfill your ministry. And third, evangelize the lost. So, evangelize the lost. Will you be like Andrew the Apostle? who excitedly told his brother, Simon Peter, we have found the Messiah. This Advent, we have about three to four weeks before Christmas. May the Lord, as you think about his second coming, God put it in your heart to save people from the fire. Jesus is not nice to have. Jesus is what you must have if you are to survive the fire and enter into the fullness of God's salvation. Heed the prophecies, fulfill your ministry, evangelize the lost. Would you stand with me as we respond to God's word? Lord, we thank you because your word is truth and your truth gives life. The truth shall set you free, your word declares. Father, we pray, give us the grace now to submit our lives to the truth. We recognize that you're a God of moral perfection, holiness, and sin will be judged, it will be, even today, cleanse us, Lord, put us right with yourself. We ask for the grace now to see Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, and to really marvel at his wonderful salvation. You save us from the fire of God, God's judgment. You bring us the fire of God's love. Oh, Lord, Lord, let that love burn. Heal our wounds. Strengthen our hearts, Lord. Use us to touch others. Come, Holy Spirit. It's a moment of silence. Now let the Lord minister to you, and then we'll worship. Pastor will lead us.